Okay, so hi, it's really a pleasure to be here today. I think you can hear me properly. Uh, I'll be talking about some of the work I've been doing with my collaborators in the, in the last years, focusing on the relationship between action and language. So uh, in the first part of the talk, I'll focus on the comparison of action and language at the structural and at the cortical levels in the second part of the talk, I present you an experiment we are currently conducting. Due to COVID, we were unable to collect enough imaging data. Instead, I'll be presenting you some behavioral result on the same experiment. And now we can get started uh, with the first part of the, of the talk. So when it comes to structure, language and action have been proposed to share similar organizational principles. So if we look at a simple example in language, it has been proposed that in order to form a noun phrase of the type the cup, I need two detached elements to be bounded together, the and cup, which when put together, give me as simple as it gets the cup as a single element. When it comes to action, it has been proposed something really similar. So concerning goal directed actions of the type grasping a cup, on the left, I have the action or the goal of grasping, which is combined on the right which, with the element to be grasped. These two structures at the first look could be deemed similar to a certain level. However, this extent still needs to be questioned uh, a bit more. So the process of binding elements together in language was defined in many ways according to many different accounts. So we can have unify, forward, backward application, sub substitution, According to the minimalist thesis, this process is called merge. And within this framework, uh, different types of merge operations have been identified, uh, but we can focus on the simplest definition we can get. So merge is a syntactic operation forming a new set out of two basic syntactic object, objects, where these objects need to fulfill some requirements in order to be bounded together. Merge can be applied recursively to form syntactic hierarchies. So I can say the cap, but I can also say by applying again merge, the cap on the table and so forth and so on. Uh, merge, uh, uh, even if it's really the basic operation for language, it needs to work in cooperation with other systems. And to do so, it has been postulated the merge uh, needs two interfaces. So uh, through the sensory motor interface, mental expressions are organized into syntactic uh, relationships and linearized in order for the mental expression to be put through speech or sign, while through the conceptual intentional interface, syntactic relationships are mapped to semantic and pragmatic features. And what modern uh, minimalist theories of language claim is that these interfaces are shared with other animal species and with other domains as well while merge per se, so the computational system remains confined exclusively to language. It is indeed, uh, indeed a bit complex to find uh, uh, parallels of merge in the action domain or even of hierarchical reapplication of merge. One attempt was made by Pastra and Aloimonos, if I pronounce it correctly, some years ago. In their paper, uh, they claimed that following action grammar production rules an action is composed by a goal and a tool, which would form something parallel to what we have seen before uh, uh, in, with relationship to language. They also claimed, interestingly enough, is that uh, all actions are composed by sub-actions and all the sub-actions must agree in terms of the final goal to be served. So if we take as an example, my will of wanting to drink some coffee, I need to postulate some sub-actions, which then lead me to my goal. So for example, I need to grasp the cup, I need to pour the coffee, and finally I need to drink the coffee. But one question that I think it's useful asking is if this is really one single action uh, fulfilling one single goal. And here I'll, I make the uh, link uh, to Clark, which I think made a really uh, nice work on definitions of language, of actions. And he mentioned that planning an action, uh, we also postulate additional states uh, which have the rights on their own to be defined as actions since they have their own goals. And to be clear, this is probably not the strongest criticism. Uh, we can move to theories postulating action and language syntactic similarities. For this, there is also really a uh, recent uh, preprint, really interesting preprint by Kopmans that came out in July, which I suggest 
to read for this. Um, for us, uh, this distinction or this specification of the action and subactions is only something useful to shift our perspective of this relationship uh, somewhere else. So more precisely, what Clark claims is that intentions create hierarchies of actions and prediction related to each level of the hierarchy itself. So now we are again going to this definition of hierarchy, but we are addressing it from a completely different perspective, rather from the reapplication of merge itself. Uh, these predictions can be of two main types. So we can have proprioceptive and exteroceptive predictions. If we go back to one of the actions mentioned before, uh, that is grasping a cup, a proprioceptive prediction would be related to the consequences of moving my arm towards the cup in order for me to grasp it. And an exteroceptive prediction would be related, for example, to the location of the, of the cup with respect to my hand. Now, I want to go back quickly to the interfaces and to the, to the language issue. So we mentioned that merge needs to work in collaboration with other systems. Uh, so with the sensory motor interface and with the conceptual intentional interface. And the question here would be, if we cannot identify language-like structures in action, can we identify action-like uh, predictive structures in language? So now we are asking the opposite question than before. And the answer, I think at this point would be uh, yes. So it has been shown recently that, for example, if we look at the sensory motor interface, we see evidence for predictive hierarchies concerning auditory consequences of speech before production and at different stages of uh, speech processing. So therefore, we could think uh, that the word hierarchy can be applied both to structure of language and to actions, but it brings different meaning uh, depending on what we look at. So in language structures, without taking the interfaces into account, hierarchies are a syntactic phenomenon and they are the result of the computational system itself. Uh, in action structures, hierarchies are related to the predictive mechanisms, mapping inputs and statistical regularities of action goal relationships. Now uh, we can uh, shift to quickly to the relationship uh, between language and action at the, at the cortical level. We know that language and action have been proposed to share a similar recruitment of uh, Brodmann area in the left inferior frontal gyrus. In language, this area has been linked to syntactic processing, um, while in action, this area seems to encode biological and goal-oriented actions. Uh, this brought many researchers to suggest that to a certain degree, uh, language and action, if recruiting the same region in the brain, must be sharing some common computational feature. However, we also know that uh, this area, B44, is not a holistic, undividable unit. As a matter of fact, uh, within this area, many clusters, many sub areas have been identified at the functional level and at the structural level in the last decade. Uh, now I can also show you some of the work that we did on this. So uh, we wanted to check, first of all, that B44 is actually involved in the action domain. And our first task was to run a comprehensive coordinate-based meta-analysis on action processing. So we collected data from more than 400 PET and fMRI experiments to investigate whether we could find common activation of B44 for different action tasks. And we could find B44 recruitment exclusively in action execution, imitation, and imagery. And here I give you an example of the action execution uh, cluster in, uh, in the red column. And while in other action tasks, so here I'm reporting action observation, uh, we could not find any convergence at all in the left inferior frontal gyrus. This leads to the conclusion that BA44 cannot be equally attributed to all action processes, but only to some of them. Also, uh, the cluster observed in action execution, imitation, and imagery is distinct from the BA44 cluster usually associated with language tasks. The action cluster um, tends to be posteriorly located and it goes towards the premotor cortex while the language cluster is anteriorly located, extending towards BA45. And always uh, using a meta-analytical approach, 
we looked at all the regions that were mostly co-activated with one of these two uh, anterior or posterior clusters of BA44. And we could observe that the anterior language-related cluster is associated with uh, a language-related network. So for example, we could observe uh, convergence in BA44 or 46 areas that are relevant for semantic tasks while the posterior cluster is associated with more of a motor specific network. And here, for example, you can see involvement of BA40 involved usually in generating motor intentions. So uh, in our paper, we hypothesized that the recruitment of uh, this posterior portion of BA44 in the action domain might be dealing with accessing and maintaining mental representations of actions which are required in uh, tasks in which the steps of an action have to be retrieved. Mental representation can be rather a, a big label for a cognitive process, but it's uh, uh, so what we mean by mental representation is really simple. So mental representations are forms of memories that can be retrieved and activated in order for me to access some sort of stored information. Importantly enough, uh, these representations are considered to be probabilistic and action-oriented. So at the cortical level, I'd like to suggest that the anterior and the posterior portions of B44 are involved in different types of processes. Anterior B44 is where the simpler uh, syntactic operations of merge can be localized, while posterior B44 we suggest could be a subregion encoding this action-oriented probabilistic representation to be sent uh, to then later on to the premotor cortex, cortex for action execution. And uh, um, while, uh, so going a little bit more also to the distinction between language and action and the recruitment of the region, while in the action domain, this area might be indeed involved in encoding probabilistic representations of action, there is no support for a causal role of the area in syntactic categorical prediction. Uh, so this would also be a divide between the roles play, played by these two subregions in two domains. Furthermore, looking at the activation of the area in the two domains, we know that in language, the more complex the structure, the stronger the engagement of the area. And this is op opposite, opposite to what happens in action where the most relatable, but not the most complex actions seem to engage the area. Finally, uh, concerning the modality, there is strong evidence for uh, BA44 recruitment in passive listening tasks, while there is weak evidence for the same in passive observation tasks, as we have also seen in uh, our uh, meta-analysis. Now to further investigate the role of B44 in action processes, uh, we are uh, currently running an fMRI study. So, but while the fMRI study is still running, today I'm gonna present you the design and some data that we got from a behavioral pilot study uh, run uh, some months ago with exactly the same design. So uh, we are adopting a within subject event related uh, design where participants have to make button presses with their right hand according to the stimuli presented. Participants one day before the scanning session uh, will be invited to learn the various types of cues uh, and the type of information encoded by the cues. Here on the right, you can see the first eight cues the participants will learn. So each cue has a specific color and to each cue corresponds a specific finger tap in sequence. So for example, participants will learn that to the pink cue corresponds the sequence index index uh, ring finger. Now these sequences can be uh, grouped together in small classes of sequences. And to each class, a cue is assigned, which is defined by a specific context informativity. Uh, so for example, the white Q here stands for the class of the two sequences, pink and purple. So whenever participants, for example, see this white Q, they know that it could stand for one of the two sequences. The gray Q stands for four possible sequences that you can see, so pink, purple, light blue, and blue, while the black Q codes all eight uh, possible sequences. So as higher we move in this informativity hierarchy, the less information is given by the context queue. 
uh, participants at the beginning of the trial uh, are shown a context queue and later on a sequence queue. When the green circle appears, participants have to perform the sequence belonging to the sequence queue. So if we take an example and look at context queue, participants see first the white queue, which stands for two possible sequences as we have just seen. So participants will have some feature to retrieve, but they don't know which sequence they actually need to perform until the purple queue arrives later on during the trial. And uh, from context one uh, to context four, you can see that the context queue gets less and less informative on the sequence to perform. So participants will have less and less information uh, to rely on uh, for performing the execution task. For this behavioral pilot study, we analyzed three movements separately. So the time participants needed to make the first, the second, and the third presses of the finger tapping sequence. To analyze this data, we used both a frequentist and a Bayesian approach. So behaviorally, we hypothesized that the type of information processed at the beginning of the trial, so at context queue, will affect later execution of the sequence encoded by the sequence queue. In particular, we predicted that only the first press uh, to be affected, since this reflects time participants need to ac access the tapping sequence. Uh, so we expected that the less informative, the context queue, the more time uh, was needed by participants in order to start the finger tapping movement. While we expected no increases in P2 and P3, so second and third movements, reflecting equal performance in purely motor aspects of the sequence. Uh, so now I present you the results from 20 subjects who completed the experiment. And here we look at the results for the first press. So the time participants needed to start the tapping movement. On the y-axis, I report the time and on the x-axis, the context level. So we run a frequentist ANOVA and we observe that there is a main effect of informativity. To check whether there is a step-by-step -step increase across conditions, we run three one-sided postdoc comparisons. And here I report Bonferroni corrected values. As you can see from the plot, there is a significant increase in the time participants need to start the tapping sequence from one level to the other of, of this context uh, informativity hierarchy, exactly as expected from our hypothesis. Then we also run a Bayesian ANOVA to confirm the results of the frequentist ANOVA. And as you can see here, this also is strongly supporting our hypothesis. Now we can look at the second press. So this is the time participants needed to shift from the first to the second movement. And we run a frequentist ANOVA uh, as before, but this time it resulted in as non-significant. Uh, but however, to check whether we had evidence not only for rejecting our hypothesis, but for accepting our null hypothesis, we ran a Bayesian ANOVA. And this gave us quite strong evidence in favor of the null hypothesis. That is to say, as expected, context informativity does not have an effect on the time participants need to make uh, the second press. Now we can look at the final and third press. And here the results are almost identical to what observed in the, uh, for the second press. So the, Bayesian, the frequentist ANOVA gave us a uh, um, non-significant effect, but then we ran the Bayesian ANOVA. And again, this time we got evidence in favor of the null hypothesis. So also in this case, we can say that the context informativity does not have an effect on the time participants need to make the third press. Uh, so now we are uh, running the study as an fMRI experiment, and we would like to investigate what happens at two different stages of the trial. We plan indeed to split the trials in two, uh, two different phases of interest and extract brain response from the presentation of the context queue, so to investigate this retrieval process, and then from the presentation of the execution uh, queue to investigate the execution process. And here now I plot some uh, hypotheses that we have concerning this uh, fMRI data. So we believe mm, that the more information can be accessed uh, from the context, the more activity in uh, BA44. This would reflect the fact that the more informative the context is, the higher is the amount of information that the region can extract. 
conversely, the more information, um, the less activity in BA6. This would reflect the fact that the more information can be accessed, the easier is the performance of the task and the, for the engagement of the premotor cortex is smaller. If we focus on the expectations uh, concerning the retrieval phase and the involvement of BA44, a finding uh, conforming to our expectation would confirm the role of the area in accessing mental representations of actions, and it would be in line with models of hierarchical control of goal-directed actions. So uh, indeed, it was already postulated the role, uh, the, the role of the caudal left prefrontal cortex and especially of BA44 in contextual control. So you can see, for example, the many studies done by Koshlen. Our study would further specify the notion of contextual control by including different levels of, this, uh, of informativity within the same uh, task set. So now, if we uh, are actually able to observe this BA44 um, uh, responsiveness to this uh, informativity hierarchy, uh, we could say the language and action might indeed share some hierarchical models uh, that could have developed in tandem. So here I, play, I plot the hierarchical control of goal-directed action, the hierarchical internal models. Uh, however, these models become evident in language uh, only once we move to the interfaces and not when we look at the computational system. As a matter of fact, the computational system might have developed in parallel to hierarchical models in language and action. And uh, at this point, with many still open questions, uh, I hope that I'm able to share also this fMRI data soon, uh, I'd like to conclude and I would like to thank you all uh, for uh, your attention, and especially I would like to thank my collaborators and here, Emiliano especially was here in the in the crowd. So thank you all.